molecular level, part of molecular level, you can not have existed without this one. That's why I can make a step of hand step. Some of you may not agree, but that is what it is. Because, because of this lady, the famous lady, Dorothy Hutkins, uh, who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for the structure of vitamin B12. I, you know, I'm also a little bit of a patriot, you know, already probably noticed I have, there has always been an Indian component associated with this. You, you know, he knows what I'm talking about. Uh, Professor Rankatesh was the person who was involved in the determination of the structure with Dr. who happens to be my professor. So, uh, Anshuman's uh, uh, grand, grandfather, academic grandfather. And so, she becomes your academic great, great grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, she, this structure was determined, and uh, before that, the very first structure of, uh, see, the idea of going to biology was very interesting. You know, Bragg and Bragg, they went to the good that sodium chloride, potassium chloride, all possible sorts, cesium chloride. They started getting the idea of ADS ratios and all these structural changes. Why sodium chloride is a different structure than cesium chloride? The radius ratio became an issue. And they were able to sort out all these things at very simple stages like cubic structures, tetragonal structures, you know, isometric structures, basically. But what, what was interesting is that there were always a parallel set of people who were thinking about it, and particularly uh, Garuts, who was a steward of uh, Bragg and company. He started saying that we should look at something which is natural. For him, sodium chloride was not natural. Chloride was soft. But what he meant by natural is something biological. And I think that heralded the interest when people started looking at, of course, the most important thing they look at, and of course, gets there, is blood. So, uh, blood is our most important biological material, particularly in those days. Uh, the red color made a big impression. In fact, that was also the uh, signal which heralded the advent of. Uh, Protein crystallography. So, the structure of hemoglobin was determined. This is 1959. I think I was 18 years old. If I'm right. Yeah. It was just 1959, September, I was 18 years old. That is when the Nobel Prize for hemoglobin was given. So, I, I was already into the bigger molecule modern crystallography era, in my opinion. Uh, but I still belong to the past. <laughs> so, this is in fact considered the past now. And uh, the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded in 1962. This uh, structure you see is not a very large molecule, but remember these were the structures which were determined, not the, based on the current modern day refractometers and automatic data collection, data collection, and so on. These were very painstakingly done. One of the things about crystallographers is that they are very patient. I don't know, all crystallographers now who claim as crystallographers, of course, are patient, but well, good crystallographers are patient. So you can test tension to see whether a good crystallographer or not. You try to test his patience and see what happens. <laughs> Somehow there is a certain amount of patience which goes in. Because what was done here is enormously, uh, unbelievably large amount of work to start with. And large amount of management using sheets of paper and hand calculators. Fourier calculations were done using hand calculators. I think some of them are used in it, right? They're So, uh, and they were also what are, they used to use what are known as beaver lips and strips. I wanted to show you a picture of that, but I couldn't get it in time. So, these beaver lips and strips will allow for point to point Fourier calculation. So, you can go from one point in the, the three dimensional uh, crystal to another point and do a Fourier calculation so that you can get the value of the electron density at the rate you would like to have. So suppose there is a A direction and you divide the A axis 10, 10 axioms into some 100 parts, we can go at point not one along that particular direction and calculate the electron using the beaver distribution and space. And these used to be a remarkable achievement. And the recording of these were done using a, using a machine uh, which was generating something like 1 to 2 kilowatt of power. And therefore, the photographs, these were our photographs. So they had to set, put a set of photographs together, a pack of photographs. 
and expose the crystal to these uh, X radiation. And there was no X ray safety cover or anything like that. Even when I was, there was no X ray safety cover. It's surprising. In fact, we were, we were told to drink a glass of milk. I don't know why, but people, there was a belief that if you drink a glass of milk every day, radiation damage will be away. It's like the old saying, you know, I will a day, it stopped us away. That's something like that. So we were, we were asked to drink a glass of milk, and in fact, we were given a glass of milk. Exactly at 11 o'clock, we were asked to go and have a glass of milk. And uh, we were also given badges. And these badges are supposed to record any radiation that comes through. And if the record that, that will go and get it evaluated in the in DRC, some fellow will measure the extent of radiation that has gone into that batch. And if that batch is leaks, you cannot do X ray machine crystallography anymore. You have to leave the X ray back. And it never did. I don't know what batches they gave. I think they, they were all dummy. It never worked. <laughs> so, so anyway, nobody left crystallography in those days because of the bad job. Everybody wanted to do this like this because of the glass of milk. So both ways it worked out. And then you measure the reflection. So the way you do that is you have the photograph, you have those cameras which were really troublesome because those cameras will move on mechanical beats. And very often than not, if you do not put enough oil, it, it is like some of the doors we have in nowadays, even in the best of the labs. When you open the door, you have a beautiful instrument sitting inside. Uh, which, which will do the femtosecond crystallography or whatever. But you go and open the door, it creeps. Uh, that is the problem. And that's how it is. And so we used to have these kind of problems, and they used to have these kind of problems. We also had these problems. So, we, for example, my thesis, you know, I told you, structure takes two hours to determine these things. My thesis took five years for four structures. And none of these structures were more than 22 uh, atoms. Okay, the biggest structure I saw for my PhD was 22 atoms. So this, this is the level at which crystallography was being done. So enormous advance, enormous advance, and in fact, there were lots of people who were doing high quality crystallography in our period. What happened to that, I will tell you after a few, uh, few minutes, what really happened to that. Uh, it has now been, crystallography people are very few, very few around the country. We used to have a large number of people interested in crystallography, they were working in crystallography. But what happened to them is the technology shock. Technology advanced so fast. Technology advanced so fast that you could collect data just like that. You could analyze data just like that. You could grow crystals of very large molecules. You could collect data so fast and understand the, you don't have to understand, but you can solve the structures so fast. Uh, so people could not keep pace with it. So those crystallographers who were very good in their crystallography methodologies, they started disappearing. So it was a real serious task for some of us to survive also. For us also, we, we had to wake up. You know, the people who were using 4K memory computers which occupied the size of this room. Remember, 4K memory occupied this room. We used to go there with puzzle cards and hand it over to the operator who would drop it back. Then we have to again redo the whole thing, all these kinds of drama. And we used to get one, one quantum quantum angle calculation done in about a week's time. Okay, so you have 10 atom structure, you want to find the quantum and angles, you give it to the computer, you want all the angles, and let's say you want also the intermolecular interaction. It will take about a week. And that was the struggle. So people, when they found that it's all going so fast, what else can I do? You know, I'm used to doing this one week work for one minute. Now, if one time comes in like that, what is the next thing I can do? So I should leave crystal. So all those good fellows who were really, really good in crystallography, they left. And they left and disappeared from there. I don't know where they are. Some of them, of course, decided to go and submit themselves to technology. They became very high quality computer programmers. And they sold themselves to companies, some IT company they joined. Many of my friends, they are, many of them are in IT companies. And they are distraught. They are good quality scientists, but now they write programs to say how much of interest that um, some Indus bank should give you in order to see that Indus banks are right. That is the type of thing they are doing. We were quality crystal before. I don't know what to mention names. One day is my university author, I think. So this is what happened. The technology 
limited quality circuits in this country. It's very interesting. Anyway, it's a part of the present past and future in any, any branch of science, including historiography. But historiography suffered the most. Historiographers suffered because they made it very easy to handle. And therefore, they have said, oh, what is there in this world? We just press a button and you can go with the structure and what is going on That was the common case. Otherwise, good historiographers passed out because of the advances made. We'll see how the advances, in fact, did make it. But this map, hats off to this lady, because she did a structure of 777 atoms, the structure of insulin. And this was all done with photographic films and things like that. And, you know, this, this diagram, I wanted to show you the younger fellows. This is how the structure was developed. There were no computers, no molecular graph. There were more, no graphics representation. So now you can represent with graphics, computer graphics, any kind of structure in any orientation you want. So why I show this picture is historical. Because what it says here is that is the plane, the AD plane. Okay, and this is the C direction. And what you see is those these are the atoms. These are the beads which essentially are put through frameworks here in such a way that we have the red color representing oxygen, this color, cyan color representing nitrogen, and things like that. And the unit cell vectors are marked. And in the unit cell, all the 777 molecules with their conformation is shown here. I'll tell you an interesting story at this point. By the way, how much time I have? I never keep track of time. Some of you are looking sleepy, so I think I have about 10 more minutes. I'll make it 15. I'll stop in 15 minutes. And I should keep track of time. I told Anshuman, he was saying only 30 slides have to look at the problem. <laughs> okay, so I, the story I must tell you. The story is that when I wanted to make a three dimensional plot, how do I do it? I don't have computers, I don't have graphics. So what I do is that I don't have money. So what I do is I go to the partner's cycle shop, bicycle shop, and buy from him spokes, bicycle spokes. So I will buy some two dozen, three dozen, depending upon how many atoms I have in my structure in the unit cell. So maybe even more. I buy hundred of them. And then go to the workshop and sharpen one end because I have to stick it into something. So that will be my axis in the Z direction. I preferably work only with quantum clinic and orthorhombic systems because a tritium system is a big nuisance because I can't show the orientation in a tritium system. So I would like to have a minimum, the best possible symmetry I can actually manipulate is with one of them. If it is anything higher than that, I'm very happy because the angles are 90 degrees or 120 degrees, which is manageable. So what I do is I will draw the projection diagram on a, on a thermocol sheet. I go and buy a thermocol sheet. We used to go to uh, this ladies' tangle shop. People used to make fun of us. We are going to ladies' tangle shop. This is where the patience issue comes up. Because many of the ladies will be buying all this ribbon, this night and all that. And I'm going to buy these beads, color beads, from the ladies' tangle shop. I want 100 of black color, 100 of blue color with my carbon and nitrogen. But I have to buy them. So I will get all these things. And then come to the lab, put the, the, the sheet, the uh, thermocol sheet. And then the Z-coordinate is fixed with the spoke. And then um, we slide this bead to the exact height to, at which our Z-value should come, the coordinate. And then fix it below that with some scotch tape. And that's how the molecular model is going to Then we believe it or not, we just could take a, take a meter stick and measure the coordinate. Of course, the scale was worked out by as 1 inch equals 1 angstrom or whatever. So we just take a scale and measure. We could measure the angles, we could measure the length, we could measure the conformation, and we were never wrong. So that is how these models were made. Look at that fantastic model, 777 atoms. That would have taken some six months to make for the old day. At that time, she was not that old when she made this. But this is one of the pictures. In fact, I must tell you about this picture. Uh, this picture shows, if you go, look closely, look at her hands. She had a very severe arthritis problem towards the end of her career. And uh, then she suffered with this quite a bit. In fact, once she, I was in Buffalo at the post office, and once I got a telephone call from the airport. She was calling me from the airport saying that I came, I was supposed to go to Toronto, but there's a blizzard going on, they stopped my flight at Buffalo. 
I don't know what to do. I am in the airport. I knew that you are here to somebody. I called somebody, 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 and got your phone. So what? What shall I do? Then I took my car and rushed to that place in a desert, which was desert in Buffalo. I think some of you know. I don't want to give the story of that. But anyway, I reached the airport, and then she couldn't move out of that place because she had this arthritis as well. I didn't want her to freeze in my car, so my car was one of those. 1950 model, so I don't want to talk about my car now. It was one of those cars in which I, I bought the car for $75. Car cost me $75. You can imagine how it was. You know? It used to run on oil, and once in a while I added gas. That's how it was. It was a very, very dirty, tricky car, but it ran. So um, <laughs> I had been there in the airport for the whole 12 hours through the night. We had lots and lots of coffee, and she talked about it, everything. He used to be a communist. Very interestingly, this is a point I must mention. I'll take four minutes more than this. I'll finish it up because some of you are feeling sleepy. Uh, most of the, I don't know why, because even the first international tables of crystallography, I'll show uh, was red in color. I don't know, but somehow uh, there was a communist attachment to crystallographers and crystallographers. It is gone now, it's all blue now, beautiful blue. And now it is not even in the book form, it is on the web. So you can download it in different places and things like that. But this, this is just a different story. But she was a hard, hardcore communist. And she was visiting some people in Canada where there was some issue which was going on uh, regarding the Politburo of Russia and things like that. So she was going to that country and she was stuck in there. Yeah. So I spent the whole night and it was a wonderful night. Uh, she used to tell me all these stories. So she had this problem, but I think eventually she this she, she took her away, and uh, she, she was she was she died a very sad death, I'm told, because of this very painful death.